Hello and welcome to the Wonder Women segment of the Maker Mom podcast. My name is Katie Freeman and I'm your host. Every week I bring you interviews of two female or non-binary makers of all kinds, some of them parents, some of them not. This week's Wonder Women guest is Lexi Moore of Lexi Moore. Um, She is a fine furniture maker and um, it's hard to describe her work because it's definitely out of the box, quote unquote. Um, so she's just super creative with what she makes and comes up with new forms and ways to highlight furniture. Um, I know you're going to really enjoy this interview. We had a good time talking about you know art school and just the world of making furniture. Uh, But before we hop on into the interview with Lexi, I want to give a big shout out and thanks to the patrons over on Patreon. So thanks so much, Kevin, Lefty's Woodshop, Christy, Twisted Twine, Christina B, Jeremy Spies, Sammy, Go Sammy Lee, Lauren, Rasp File Design, Sven, Dwarf Size Workshop, Rachel, Moody Makes, Bonnie, Tool Mom, Bonnie, ToolMomStore.com, Laura, Oakley Soap Company, Mary Lou, made by Mary Lou, Amy, Bison Valley Carving, Dan and Kelly, Reclaim Living Store, Brandy, Studio Obey, Kathy, One Girl and Her Tools, Ellen, Little Bear Furniture, and Ethan, Ethan Carter Designs. Thank you all so very much for your ongoing and continued support helping me to produce two episodes a week, every week. And with no further ado, here is Lexi Moore. Well, I always have a start with the guests introducing themselves. So okay. I'm going to let you do that when you are ready. Okay, I'm, I'm ready. Um, <laughs> I am Lexi Moore. I'm a fine furniture maker and a woodworker. Um, is that it? Should I get more? Okay. No, oh, you Thank can you. do that. <laughs> I'm good with that. I figured we'll get into the rest of it as we go. Yeah. Um, and you're currently in school, right? So no, so I was in grad school okay. and I did about a year and then I took a leave of absence and did some other stuff. Um, I still plan on returning and finishing that degree, um, but I am working at a school right now. I'm the mm-hmm. artist in resident at the school that I got my undergraduate degree, which is Tennessee Tech. And they have a satellite campus, which is the Appalachian Center for Craft. Mm-hmm. So it's just like this craft school in the middle of nowhere on a hill. It's great. So that's what I'm doing for now. And that's a two-year residency. So I'll be done here in 2023. And then I'll probably go back and finish my degree. Okay. All right. Um, Well, before we get to like how you got there, where did you grow up? And what kind of things were you interested in as a kid? I grew up in Chattanooga, Tennessee which is like two hours south from Nashville. Um, And I grew up on a ranch. So that was cool. Lots of wide open spaces, lots of weird animals. We had a pet beaver one time. That was kind of cool. And I was always pretty interested in art. Um, My mom wasn't an artist by profession by any means, but she painted everything in our house. She painted the walls. She painted outfits for Girl Scouts for me. and I personally think she was really talented. So kind of observing that and like her DIYness. And then my dad, on the other hand, is just like a good old country boy who wants to make everything himself and doesn't want to pay anybody to do it. Um, and he was good at that too. I watched him make a water fountain for our pond out of a washing machine. So that was pretty <laughs> That <interesting>. sounds intriguing. <laughs> yeah. So I think just kind of being around that idea of like if you want it you can make it and 
you can also make it really beautiful too. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I just ran with that. I think I always did art stuff. I, because we had a lot of dead animals on this ranch, I would kind of like take these longhorn skulls and mosaic them and I painted and I took every art class that I could and I was drawing a lot. Um, I never went to a school that offered like shop classes or, mm -hmm. or ceramics or anything like that. So I just took what I could. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. Were you like, I guess, you know, you, you mentioned the, like the mosaic of, of like the longhorns and stuff, but were you getting into or able to get into any kind of like woodwork or making at home with what your parents had available to you? I don't know that I was interested in that yet. I think that part of like the building part of me came mm -hmm. later. I think my initial interest in art was very uh, bedazzling and <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think I wanted to do a lot of 2D things starting out and I wanted to be like very emotional and like make very I'm not like that really at all now, or at least <laughs> outwardly on the inside, probably still happening, but um, uh, no, and, and there was this weird part of me when I was little that it, that was like, I want to make money doing this too, so I would take my friends like guitar cases and get like gel sharpies, and I'd be like, whatever you want, I'll put it on here as long as you pay me 50 bucks, and <laughs> And like flower crowns. I was like, you want this? You could buy it. Give me a quarter. <laughs> so I think I had this goal to make that. So you were you were hustling even then, uh, trying to make the dream real. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wanted to I wanted to believe that that was a possibility because I think a big part of me put off becoming a maker or an artist because I didn't think that you could make a living off of it. It, it scared me, the job mm -hmm. security of it. So I was like constantly convincing myself that I was going to do it. So did you get any of that idea though? I mean, was that anything you heard at home or in school? Like the whole, you know, starving artist trope that you can't make money doing, doing what you love? Not directly. Um, I, I mean, I heard of the starving artist thing, but I think I just observed the the adult figures around me that were pretty stable and successful, it wasn't through art. So I don't know that mm -hmm. I had anyone to look up to that was making that work, um, but that didn't matter. So mm -hmm. I, I knew that it was a hobby thing and I knew that I would always pursue that as a hobby, but I, I really needed it to, to be my main focus and the main thing that I do, I think, or I don't know that I would have been happy doing anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So after high school, uh, went to art school or? After high school, I went to college. I was in undergrad for like 10 years trying to figure this out. <laughs> I was an English major. I was an exercise science major. I mean, I just, again, I was like, okay, I'm gonna have to figure out something else and then art can be on the side. And I finally decided on exercise science and I was trying really hard, but I was so bad at it. I am not a textbooks girl. Um, and at the time I was teaching gymnastics classes to make some money. And they gave me the opportunity to like mural the whole building. And so I was like, yes, I wanna quit doing this and I wanna mural the whole building and I'm gonna sell these longhorns and I'm gonna, <laughs> And they paid me like even more to mural the building than to teach the classes. So that kind of like sparked some hope. And then shortly after that, I took a trip uh, when my, my grandpa took me to Italy and I got to go to Murano and see people blowing glass. And also Italy is just like incredible in the sense of a lot of crafts and, and mosaics inside of their, their buildings and the architecture is just incredible. And after I came back from that, I just made a decision that I was just going to do it. I was going to go for it, whether I was broke or not. I was going to try it out. Nothing made me feel like more alive than that, uh, than observing it. And then the process of making it, too, is this whole other thing of like therapy and helping with self-esteem and believing you can stand up on your own two feet. So 
So I was looking up schools that I could do. I knew that I might be interested in woodworking, but I knew for sure that I wanted to do glass blowing. And I was looking up schools locally. I didn't want to go too far. I have a, a family um, that I like to be around. So I wanted to be close to them. And this was the only school in Tennessee that offered a BFA in woodworking and also offered glass blowing. So I scheduled a tour and at the time, the man who ran the wood program is this incredibly hilarious South African, um, very intelligent, uh, but just silly guy. And he gave me the tour. And I think first I was sold on him. I just, <laughs> I just really enjoyed his company and the glass blowing, the facilities at the school are incredible, all of them. I have been to several wood shops and I haven't seen one that is quite as like expansive with well-functioning machines. Um, and so I took intro to glass and then I took intro to wood and I hated everything about making glass. I am, I have the nerves of like a chihuahua. So I was just super stressed out at the pace of it and wood was really slow and well thought out and I just fell in love with it and awesome rest is history there's a love story <laughs> man yeah <laughs> so see so yeah, now I'm talking to somebody with like real experience with the glass glass thing I'm like a bit obsessed with the Netflix show Blown Away and watching them do glass blowing, and I'm just like, oh my god, it looks so amazing. Um, it's very performative, you know? yeah. It's kind of, it's yeah. kind of like a, you get to be a sexy rock star, <laughs> so it's very appealing in that way, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I mean, the closest I've gotten to glass blowing as far as like work wise is just I had a piece that was commissioned a floor lamp that was commissioned. And so I carved the, the floor, the wooden, you know, the base. And then uh, I worked with the client to get a glass blower to make the, the globe that sat on top so that it would be custom for the piece too. Um, and found out that actually like in here in the Midwest, here in Iowa, there is no hot shop except for like outside of this community college that's like in the middle of nowhere. So I found out that at least hot shop wise for glass blowing, there's not, there's not actually a lot of opportunity in the States. Uh, yeah. They that. go like, I think that glass blowers kind of get used to the idea that they have to move a lot to make it work. And I, th and I think that's a good, I have a really, um, a lot of close friends that are glass blowers, and I think that that's you know they just travel around and make connections and assist for people and get experiences mm -hmm. in different shops and in a lot of ways people will pay uh, for them to come out there and they'll just kind of do assistantships for free in exchange mm -hmm. for the travel and so it's a different thing yeah but mm -hmm. it's cool. <laughs> Today's sponsor is Rasp and File Designs. Rasp and File was created to give new life to old things and create spaces that feel timeless, unique, and warm. Your home and business should be your sanctuary, a place of solace, and your personal piece of art. The owner and woodworker behind Rasp and File Designs is Lauren Matthews, and you can follow along and find out more information on Instagram, just look up Rasp Filed Designs or on the internet at rfdesigns.squarespace.com. With your woodworking, because I do follow along with you and see what you make, like you I would say you don't fall into the like traditional <laughs> um, type of you know design so once you got into intro to woodwork and continued down the path like did you start right away trying to push your own aesthetic into your pieces I think so I mean I didn't really know what my aesthetic was yet I just I think I just wanted to torture myself in a lot of ways <laughs> you know I just I think I 
I, I looked at a lot of work, a lot of work. Um, and I think that my work reflects just a huge pool of influence because I kind of liked everything and I could pick out a lot of things in different furniture movements that I liked and wanted to kind of incorporate mm -hmm. in. I also really like the palette of wood. So I use a lot of different veneers and different types of wood. And I really like marquetry because that's kind of like painting or drawing on wood. But it took me a while to figure that out. And, and, I, and the program that I took taught me techniques semester to semester. So just working with the skill sets that I was developing at the time. I do think I was trying to push push it. I probably annoyed the hell out of my instructor. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't know, maybe because I hadn't really touched wood before I went into it. I wasn't really held back or restricted in my mind by what I could or couldn't do because I didn't totally understand wood movement at the time mm -hmm. or joinery and how that worked. And so my sketches were just whatever the heck I wanted. And then I could go to my professor who was really knowledgeable and be like, how can I make this work? Mm -hmm. And he worked with me a lot on that. And he would go home and I could tell he would think about it before he went to bed and he would show up to school with something that he brought from his personal shop and be like, I think this could work for you. So I think if you are in that position and you're learning from someone and you're really interested, if you put the effort in to make something extraordinary happen, they'll kind of meet you in the middle, or at least I think that made a really good instructor for me. So right. And I was also taking other intro classes. So I did the glass, but I took every intro class that they had to offer here. So I took metals and I took fibers and I took, I'm going to leave one out. No, you're going <laughs> to be mad at me. Oh, ceramics. And so, and the forms in all of those mediums are very different. And mm -hmm. yeah, I don't, I just, I just remember looking at everything and I sketched all the time and, and I felt really um, honored and, grateful and privileged to be able to do what I was doing so I didn't want to take advantage of any of it or miss an opportunity to do and I had access to this wonderful shop too and I knew that I was only going to be here for a certain amount of time so I was like oh, I really want to just boss hog through this thing yeah with the BFA I mean besides like learning the craft of making you know certain pieces were you getting to study just like design this program isn't super design oriented there's also no like cnc or anything like that mm -hmm. so it actually the program itself is very traditional um but I don't know, the design part for me came kind of, e I say easy, it wasn't easy, it was hours and hours and hours of drawing and redrawing and figuring stuff out, but I just, I, maybe I just enjoyed it, mm -hmm. and I thought that furniture was just beautiful when it was done right, and so it was, I had like this girl crush on furniture too, so it was just, <laughs> uh, you know, kind of drawing up my future wife, or, you know, and so I just, um, yeah, that part just kind of fell into place. And, and I think it was just, I got lucky on that as mm -hmm. far as my intuition went. Um, and I say that like, you know, my stuff isn't for a lot of people, but right. the people that it is, I think. Yeah. Well, I think they're silly if it's not, because seriously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I think uh, you hit on something like, I've had people on the, podcasts that are like either degreed or just like really self-taught design oriented and then people who are like more I guess like craft oriented um and I think there's something to be said uh I don't know if you will feel the same way like when I draw up my stuff I have no formal training in design like I can't tell you like the periods of furniture design and and like what they were called you know um <laughs> or any of that but I think that's like beneficial because then it doesn't like hold me back because like you when I did have some formal woodwork 
woodworking training in, in a classroom setting, I was doing the same thing. I was like, just like crazy sketches and bring it to my professor and be like, so how do I make this work? <laughs> like, yeah, You know, and I think that was beneficial because it's like, I wasn't trying to like uh, reproduce or make sure that I was hitting like a certain aesthetic. I just knew the lines and shapes that I liked. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's why I've ended up falling into power carving because I've found traditional Woodworking makes it really hard to produce the lines and shapes that I enjoy mm -hmm. um, so much. So like, but if you're in that traditional program, like, were you standing out in that regard, just in the sense, like, your fellow students, were they kind of falling in with the more tradition? Or do you think everybody was like, kind of pushing the boundaries a little bit? I think there was both. I think it was, um, also, I feel like I'm just wrapping my head around all the furniture movements and stuff too. <laughs> yeah. so, and I did get classes on that. Um, but I think it was both because we, while we were encouraged to kind of do our research and know those different things, I think, and, and although the semesters were based off traditional woodworking techniques, we were still encouraged to be really creative mm -hmm. about it. Um, and we, hmm, what do I want? I feel like my brain, my brain just left my body. Um, I, yeah, there's just too many students that came in out of there to pin down. Everyone was so different and everyone mm -hmm. had their different challenges. And I also just became like a slave to that shop too, where I just really didn't ever stop spending time in there. And I think that was important too, because like I would cut some stuff up and then I would have these little blocks and then I would just put them on top of things and reorganize things. And so learning through just happenstance of that too. Mm -hmm. But I think that, yeah, I don't think you need to know all those furniture movements and styles and things um, to produce a really interesting piece of work. I think those things almost come more into play and become more important when you're trying to do concept-based work. Like in grad school, I was really encouraged to look at those things and then maybe take that history because all of those are attached to a certain history and right. then apply that to something now and, and change the change the dialogue around it but I found that to be like like really inhibiting like you mm -hmm. said like it was holding me back from being creative because it was making me get really in my head mm -hmm. and I think that making is a lot about being out of your head and you know to be honest the what I have learned about the history of the furniture movement personally I don't want to have a connection with it. I don't want to have a yeah. connection with things being stolen <laughs> and rebranded as somebody else's ideas and essentially being passed down through history with not understanding that, you know, um, for instance, a lot of black and brown hands were behind creating mm -hmm. a lot of the movements of furniture that we look to today, but people don't know that. And so, I don't know. I have a hard time just mentally wrapping my head around that of like, I feel like I'm adding to the continued suppression of somebody else's history. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, great works of fine art were usually for very rich, very ske sketchy <laughs> people. <laughs> and there's a lot of, um, yeah, false beliefs around those things. So I kind of felt the same way. That's why when I was encouraged to kind of do that in grad school, I was like, I don't know if I want to touch that and get into that uh, just yet. <laughs> so I agree 100%. <laughs> so would you call yourself like more of an artist or like a designer? Like, and I ask in the sense of like, is it, are you chasing down like, you know, uh, gallery type pieces or are you chasing down um you know a line of lexi moore furniture or chasing down something completely different i don't think i've pinned that down yet and that's something i'm trying to think about a lot is like what direction 
do I want to go with that? I think I consider myself more of a artist than a designer. <laughs> I'm also, I'm terrified to call myself a designer because I can hardly work a computer. And I feel like that's very important in order to call yourself a designer. Um, but I do like the design process of furniture. Um, and I think that would be a cool thing. But the the act of like sitting on a computer and just designing furniture doesn't appeal to me at all. And I don't even think that I would maybe even design anything that good if I did it that way. It's a combination of sketching and visualizing it and then putting my hands on the material. The work part of it is really important to me. I always want to make mm -hmm. what I design. So in that sense, I guess artists would be better. The direction that I want my work to go galleries are cool I, you know I'm into that I like being in exhibitions and I would like to put some of my stuff in galleries I'm also super cool with somebody just wanting my piece in their home mm -hmm. and that I'm okay with that too I don't like I said like I just want to be able to make a life out of this whether my name is big and I'm important doesn't so much matter to me. Mm -hmm. So I'm cool with whatever, as long as I can <laughs> wake up and feed myself and have a nice place I can go home and get to do work that I really enjoy. To me, that is like the optimal life. So have you done any commissioned work for people? I have, and I, that, I find that to be testy. Some of <laughs> You know, like I, I just get had, it. <laughs> it's so much work if they bail out. Just mm -hmm. even designing options for them takes like two weeks. <laughs> I won't name names, but I recently had someone who wanted to come buy a table. And then I informed her that I did commission work because she wanted to know if I did. And so she didn't buy the table and instead she commissioned me for a much larger piece. And so I spent two weeks doing these designs for her and I do all my designs by hand because again I, I can't work a computer to save my life and and then she just vanished and then every couple weeks she'll text me and send me a picture of something that she wants made that isn't the kind of stuff that I make at all and she'll be like can I get you to do this and I just have stopped replying completely and that's kind of a more extreme case yeah but um but people who who come to me about a commission and fall through with it. Yeah, I'm happy to do commissions. I I would say I feel lucky in a lot of the commissions that I've done because in a, in a lot of ways, they give me a lot of freedom. They're like, mm -hmm. I just want this done, but I really like your style and what you're doing. So like do whatever you want to do as long as it's within the price range. Mm -hmm. So that makes it kind of fun for me. Hey, makers. I want to tell you a little bit about today's episode's sponsor, Athena Outfitters. So when I'm in the market for a new pair of work boots, I do a ton of research, make sure I'm getting something that's going to fit right and going to last. Well, Athena Outfitters is a quality workwear brand for hardworking women that has a tons of experience with footwear. They've taken the time to select the very best shoes and boots made by each of the most reliable footwear brands. And when I shop at Athena Outfitters site, it saves me time and energy because I trust that they found the best shoes for every job and activity. Plus bonus, you can shop online. So next time you need new work boots or some other type of high performance shoe, check out athenaoutfitters.com, uh, gear with grit, and Athena is A-T-H-E-N-A, -E and then outfitters.com. You can also get a special discount at checkout by using the coupon code MM, that's capital M, capital M15 for 15% off any purchase just because you're a listener of the podcast. All right, let's hop back into the episode. Yeah, that's where I like struggle with or I'm trying to find is, you know, I get plenty of requests to make stuff, but none of it falls within my style. Um, I find that problematic. So it is. I'm like, I'm just like, have you, 
have you not <laughs> seen what I make? Like, <laughs> um, and so really what I've done is instead of just flat out saying no, I'll just basically price it out so high that I know the answer will be no. <laughs> yeah, girl. <laughs> I'm like, because this is what I would rather be making. So if you're not going to let me make what I would rather be making, then this is the price you have to pay. (laughs) Um, And yes, (laughs) that's perfectly acceptable behavior. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Because it is, it's like, you know, if I'm, and I honestly, of course, I've made pieces that is not something like I'm passionate about. Like I made you tip. Utilitarian. I can't say that word. Um, Utilitarian. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Pieces that are more like for kids, you know, because it will be something I made for my kids, and then somebody else with kids will be like, "Can you please, please, please make that for my kid?" And I'll be like, "Okay," you know. It's not, but it's still like I don't know. I'm like more passionate about knowing that a kid's gonna have fun with it, and so then it's like okay. Sure. But um, outside of that. Um, recently I've had somebody who continues to call and leave voicemails and they're just not getting it that I'm not returning the voicemail, the <laughs> call asking me if I make gliders and I'm like, does anything anywhere on any of my social media, <laughs> that's a totally different ball game. <laughs> yes. Tell you that that's what I make. Nope. <laughs> a lot do of people not. don't understand you know, that woodwork is woodwork and they don't understand that like furniture making is very different than making guitars and it's very different than making gliders or even turners that's a whole category that's a whole category (laughs) (laughs) reclaim stuff there's all yeah everybody does something different so and I can't blame them I don't know that I would have known the difference until I got into this but right but yeah I think so I just unless I really want to spend the time trying to figure those things out I just tell them that I don't that's not the type of work that I do. Right. Um, and I'll try to recommend it to somebody that I know that does do that. I do that as well. I do at least try to follow it up with like, I'm like, at least I can kind of try to help you out. Cause obviously you're asking me because you don't know anybody else. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. It's this sort of thing. So uh, I'll, you know, I'll try to find somebody else who can, who can help. Uh, when you were in the, the wood, program and now like in in the residency I'm just curious uh gender makeup of classmates and those you're you're working with uh it's it fluctuates but if if I had to encapsulate it as one big experience I there's definitely more guys than girls or men than women, <laughs> that's what I should say, uh, and, but I, so a lot of females come in, and they take courses, but I would say very few females have graduated, like, done the whole mm-hmm. thing, and then some, some, most semesters, it was me and a bunch of boys, men, mm-hmm. Uh, that were all dudes. my friends. I would call them dudes, but dudes, thank you. I don't know why I keep wanting to say boys. Uh, that were all my friends, and right. I've made wonderful connections uh, through that program. And everybody has been super nice for the most part. And then, um, then I think there was one semester where it was like eighty percent women, and that was that was pretty awesome too. Because mm-hmm. just in what I do, that's just less common. So right. <laughs> that's kind of fun. But yeah, I mean, any, any, just in general, this woodworking encompasses a lot more men. I think as far as my followers go, they're like 90% white males around the age of 45, so, <laughs> which is cool. <laughs> Love that. You're right. Love it all. <laughs> it's all fine and well, but so yeah, I think it's just exciting when you meet other female woodworkers, um, camaraderie there. But yeah, I guess I just don't really try to think too much about gender unless it, it becomes something that's a problem. And I just haven't personally run into that too much. Mm-hmm. So was there any, did it even cross your mind about that when you went into the program? that you could potentially be 
a minority? Yeah, I thought about it. In a lot of ways, I thought about it like, I just didn't care. I think I always went into it and I'm, I still think about this a lot that like, I feel like I have to be very good at, at it mm-hmm. um, in order to avoid any potential. I do get, okay, first of all, I'm like five two, I'm super short. Right. I'm, I'm 28 years old. A lot of people think I'm like 18 and, and I'm a girl. And I wear makeup and sometimes I wear pink and I let my hair down. And I, I, the only thing that I have run into is when I tell people that I'm a woodworker, they treat me like that's a very cute thing for me to say. Um, Like I'm a little girl that has dreams of becoming a woodworker. And it's not until I bring out my Instagram or I have a printed out portfolio in my studio too, that I could just accidentally leave around Right. (laughs) that that they actually take me seriously. And I think that that's kind of the key in, and it sucks that we have to do that Mm because you shouldn't have to, but in the instances where I have, that has been really important because the second that I showed them that I'm serious about it, that I worked very hard to get to where I'm at with it. And I do think that I'm, I'm good at it. I don't want to mm-hmm. sound, but I, but I worked hard for that. So I feel like I should get to say that as soon as that's happened, those comments and the, the way that I'm, that goes away. Right. So I guess I just knew, and I guess I just always knew that I'm a pretty passionate person. So if I loved it as much as I thought I would, I just didn't think I was going to have a problem putting in the time mm-hmm. to to get it to where I wanted it to be. And then I would be able to let the work speak for itself. For a long time, I was really hesitant about even posting pictures of myself on my Instagram um, because of that reason. I just really wanted the work to speak for itself. And then mm-hmm. and then I just stopped caring, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, I totally understand that actually. It took a really long time. Like if you go way back and I think I have last I noticed anyway something like 1400 posts or something like that on Instagram um and if you go way back you won't find pictures with me in it or even videos I did I really tried hard not to show myself those are the best ones when you're dancing (laughs) I I know Uh, (laughs) (laughs) um but you know it was it was because I was really nervous Um, and, and personally, I was really nervous because, uh, you know, the, the longer I live and the more I don't give a crap, I know I read gay from the get go. And so so I'm like, I was more, I was probably more hesitant about that than like the, the gender issue. Um, because, uh, all through school, in, in my professional career and everything, I'm surrounded by men. So the the idea of being like the only girl in the group doesn't really bother me anymore because um, I can hang with one of the guys type thing. Uh, mm-hmm. But the, the issues around, uh, you know, people making comments about my sexuality, that bothers me still. And so I was really nervous about that. Luckily, I've only had, you know, some comments and it's, it's gotten to a point now where I can just be like, well, duh, like you're not, <laughs> not surprising me with that comment, you know, sure. um, but I have had the same thing. Like you talked about with the, the, oh, isn't that cute that you think you can kind of woodwork um, where actually what I tend to get is when I tell people I make furniture, they're like, oh, you mean like you buy pieces and you refurbish them or you paint them and like, no (laughs) no in fact that's my version of hell like I don't enjoy refinishing furniture Mm -mm. at all um so I'll say no I make it from scratch you know and they're like oh okay even that I don't think they understand what scratch means they're like palettes you got some palettes (laughs) yes (laughs) and so I have to do the same thing because or they'll you know they might just ask well can we see some of your work and so I bring out the the Instagram Mm -hmm. or whatever and show them they're like oh oh okay well that's kind of cool you know and like and and then it does change they don't have that tone or anything again after that um 
but it is one of those things of like, yeah, I, I kind of think if I was male and said I made furniture, you never would have let your mind go to refinishing or pallet wood furniture or any of that stuff. Like you just wouldn't have gone there if I was male. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I don't I don't know that you'd have to get your phone out and like no. justify <laughs> the stuff that you make um maybe but I don't know I mean because maybe because I'm in this position too anytime somebody tells me usually they tell me that they're a furniture maker in response to me saying it yeah and I never treat them like any I don't react in any way and I just and I I just ask I just say like I would love to see your work and I would because mm-hmm. you know maybe it'd be somebody I want to collaborate with or right, maybe right. you know or maybe they even have like issues figuring something out because they had to teach themselves and I had formal mm-hmm. training um so that's just kind of how I go about that yeah but yeah I don't know and I don't even know if the people that do it are aware that they're doing that maybe that's not their intention I think some definitely are intention by doing that I don't know if I've become like sensitive to it because it's happened that I'm just like nope you're not gonna do that look at this picture I made this (laughs) you got it like ready saved on the phone ready to go (laughs) yeah and that's kind of like the only part of like like you know, there's really fame and woodworking is still not like, but, but of having my name known, that's really the only thing that where that appeals to me is that I stop having to stand up for what I do and like defend it all Mm -hmm. the time that I don't, yeah, just staple some pallet wood together or something. Mm -hmm. Today's episode is brought to you by ToolMomStore.com. ToolMom and company is for all ages, genders. They have what you need for your one-stop tool-related merchandise of gifts and clothing. Uh, The products are fun, fashionable, one-of-a-kind. In fact, I have two of the mugs. Uh, One has a circular saw with flames coming off of it. It says, Go Girl. Another one has the definition of a tool chick. Both of them are super awesome, and I have coffee out of them almost every morning. So check out toolmomstore.com or find them on Instagram at toolmombonnie. You can receive an extra 20% off at checkout by using the code MAKERMOM. Yeah, Yeah, no, I I get that. And I think I'm along the same level of I don't necessarily desire to see my name up in lights by any means. But being able to just interact with regular people out in the world without having to like justify myself all the time would be kind of (laughs) nice, you know? Um, So tell me more about the residency. And you you said two year residency ends in 2023. So you just started then. I started, okay, wait, maybe it's, okay, 2022. Yeah. (laughs) That sounds more correct. <laughs> I, I started, I started here in, it was either late August or early September, and it's basically, so I assist the department head with classes, so I do work directly with the students um, four days a week, and then I have shop tech hours. So part of it is to do 20 hours of, you know, shop maintenance, working on machines, so much sweeping of sawdust, holy smokes, (laughs) (laughs) cleaning out nasty stuff. Um, Here's a, here's a tip on that leaf blowers. Yeah. Well, well, we have like an air compression system and that, that helps, but you know, when you have students and it's a communal <laughs> shop yes. and they're just <laughs> finally kind of figuring out that they need to sweep up um some of them do really great but yeah it's a lot of of just cleaning and daily maintenance and um 
And then I'm also required to make work while I'm here. So we have some like artists in resident exhibitions. I think every semester there's one. And then on top of that, I'm just trying to make as much work as I can mm-hmm. to while I have access to these facilities. Um, <laughs> and then I also work two hours in the library and I'm also on security. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a well-rounded... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a jack of all trades right now. So, <laughs> so it's good, but um, but I really enjoy it. I I really the students right now. It's a really good bunch. They're very excited and ecstatic about what they're like. A group of little hyenas, like they are just constantly in there cracking up. It, it, I think it's hilarious. And so. And I think it's really inspiring on this end where I'm like making my work and then I'm just watching them figure this out and Mm -hmm. kind of not knowing the rules to it. So like bringing all these designs and these ideas. And I always thought that I would want to teach. That's why I started getting my master's degree. And I think this is in some ways kind of solidifying that it's really rewarding. So that's fun. Making is fun. Sweeping is not fun. Uh, but it's a really good residency and it's actually I don't not a lot of people know about this place and they Mm -hmm. definitely don't know about the residency so after I get shooed out of here maybe someone who's watching this can uh can can go in because this is great uh, yeah so as somebody who did not spend any time in the art world um and really know real access to it until I was an adult I never even heard of like residencies I wish I would have known stuff like that when mm-hmm. like you know I was getting out of college or at least in my 20s where I could afford to like do that uh type of thing but what's the like what do you think's the biggest benefit of doing a residency program it it gives you the opportunity to make your own work in a lot of ways that real life doesn't because it's, you know, I'm, I am working a lot. Um, but this residency specifically gives you free housing. So that's a big expense taken off. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's other opportunities to kind of to make up for some of that money. So it doesn't pay a lot, but it pays enough to where you can come out in the woods and you can spend two years making exactly what you want to do and I think that that's just not all and it gives you the facilities to do that so I know that when I because before I when I took when I left Maine Maine is where I went to grad school I went to Maine College of Art I took a break in between there and coming here and I moved to Minneapolis Minnesota and worked for a room and board Mm -hmm. which is a great company to work for I can't say enough great things about that that was another situation where I was like one girl out of a hundred (laughs) dudes I think there there was one other girl she's my boss (laughs) but everyone else (laughs) was a dude and it was awesome I felt like I was on a sitcom it was great um but and I was doing I was doing repair work so um I don't know how much I'm allowed to say about anything. Anyways, I was doing repair work and, um, and it was an eight hour, nine hour job a day. And then I would come home and I was still trying to work on personal projects, but it wasn't the same creative freedom of being able to spend Mm -hmm. so much time on your own stuff. I just think that that, if you get the opportunity to do that, it's just really important because there's not a lot of situations in life, unless you, can cultivate that for yourself and, mm-hmm. you know, make your own shop and your own, find out how to sell your work. Um, this is just good for that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I feel like I answered that question in a lot yeah. of circles. No, no, you're good. <laughs> you're good. Um, so I have to uh, get into uh, your carving work and like your hexagon uh, pieces and then your the worm one that you did recently. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was an accident that it looked like a worm. <laughs> but it was, it's so fun. Um, <clears throat> are you carving like hammer and chisel? Or are you carving power carving? Like how do you do your carving work? I do both. 
Um, I got a little, I think it's Arbor Tech. Um, it's like a ball gouge. Yep. Yeah. And I got that for Christmas and I just kind of started playing with it. And that is, that's where the worm came from. And I'm still playing with it and doing some more stuff with that. So, but I also have some power chisels mm-hmm. um, and I feel like I should totally plug them right now. And I can't think of what that company is called, but those are awesome. They are better for harder woods because mm-hmm. like poplar, so like fuzzy, it just mm-hmm. creates a big fuzzy mess. Um, and then I also use a lot of saber tooth products and mm-hmm. I think you have some of those, correct? I yeah. I, I, I kind of go between like saber tooth and cuts all. Um, mm-hmm. like I have a relationship with cuts all. So I usually, I use them more than anybody as far as that. And then your Arbor tech, I use another company that has a similar type technology, but I like better. Um, and mm-hmm. that's, uh, Manpa they're out of, um, South Korea, but <clears throat> it's a similar type thing all with angle grinders or die grinders. Okay. Yeah, so I think you work on a much larger scale than me, which I really want to get like all the tools that you have because I want to (laughs) start doing carving on a larger scale. Yeah. Um, So, I mean, really, whether I do hand carving or power carving kind of depends on the material and how the material Mm -hmm. handles it. Uh, I also use a lot of milk paint and things like that sometimes, Mm -hmm. too. Um. So yeah, but usually I start out with those on a small scale just to get little, a lot of the carving I've done has just been to try to get samples for bigger stuff. So I just Mm -hmm. spend a lot of time, you know, making, figuring out different options and all the things I can do and what I like and what I don't like. It's just, I would think it's different. I guess I wasn't aware of like the power chisels. I'll have to like look into that a little bit, but As far as the other stuff, like the saber tooth or any of those, they're like um, a carbide bits, right? And they're producing mm-hmm. a different texture than mm-hmm. like a chisel is going to do. Um, the Arbor Tech or the Mampa stuff will give you, can give you a texture more like a chisel. Um, so it's just, <clears throat> I'm super intrigued. Like there's a few uh like sculptural furniture makers that I follow um that do it all by hand you know um and I'm just like amazed for one I don't think I don't think personally my body could take it I would I would have to build up a lot of strength to be able to do that and power carving is already hard enough on my body. Mm -hmm. Like I can't imagine having to swing a hammer um, or, you know, big mallet to get some of those pieces uh, to wear. It's a lot on your wrists too. I'm actually getting, getting a little concerned. (laughs) My, my body's just changing and Mm -hmm. I have to, I can't even like open a can of soda in the morning. I have to like warm my hands up first. So my Mm -hmm. fingers and my wrists are definitely, and and when I carve by hand, and these are, you know, things that are maybe like this big, and so I can't imagine going much bigger than that, it is really taxing on your body, and your neck too, the way you have to hold (laughs) your body to do it, yeah, so, and that's really why I started investing in the carbide bits and the more power tools, is I just didn't feel like it was sustainable for my body if I want to keep doing this for a long time, yeah, and honestly, like, that's, um, like I have the same issue, even though I power carve, like I have tennis elbow on my right arm because I'm predominantly right-handed. And so that's what I'm gripping the tools with and, um, <clears throat> and the vibration and the grip size is just basically getting to, to me. Um, so much so that uh, I am going down the path and the intent of making power tools for women. That is my new. Yeah. I was about to say just that. And I was like, part of me is like, wait, I don't know if I should say this because you know, how like Vic came up with that, like pin for lady. Yeah. (laughs) But this is a real thing because my hands are so much smaller and yeah, grinders and even Dremels, even just using a Dremel, that is way too big. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Yeah. So, so, so yeah, you do that. I'll be your first customer. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the path I'm going down and it's going to, it's going to take a lot. It's going to take time. Uh, but what I've been finding so intriguing in doing the research for that is so many companies have written it in black and white that they understand that the female hand size is smaller, but it's kind of like, we don't care. (laughs) You know, they're making tools for the, for the male grip. And, but I would even posit that like tools are probably too big for a lot of men out there as well. Yeah. Cause I think the idea (laughs) is that you're this burly lumberjack of a man, maybe. I mean, I just got some, um, a block plane and a shoulder plane from Lee Nielsen. I Mm -hmm. really like their tools and it just was so big for my hands and they're great. They'll work with you. I called them and I was like, I have small lady hands and I think (laughs) that I need something else for this. And so they gave me some recommendations and we swapped it out, but Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it is a, it's totally a thing um, Mm -hmm. having to navigate that. And it's even a thing, like the reason I say, I think it can even be an issue for men is like, there is a whole, I think, I believe it's called like vibratory syndrome that a lot of like construction workers get from working with power tools all day long, where they get to a point where they, they can't use their hands because like it is permanent. The nerves and the tendons and the muscles are permanently damaged from it. I believe that. Yeah, Uh, definitely. And so I'm like, this is like an actual issue that should be being addressed. Mm-hmm. And it just boggles my mind that nobody's like really addressing it. Addressing it. <laughs> yeah, I think every everybody's focus is just more focused on making robots to do all this stuff instead. So they're not really making <laughs> solutions for the humans that don't want to give it up. Um, so yeah, I think that's incredible and great. And if yeah, I think you should totally do that. Yeah, that would be amazing. I'll, I'll add you to the to the list of uh, survey takers for mm-hmm. uh, gathering information. Okay, <laughs> I'd like that. Yeah. Um, well, so we're like at the end of our time together. That hour went by pretty quickly. Um, you know. <laughs> but I want to let give you a chance to let people know how they can find you and follow along with you and see all of your work yeah um I have Instagram my Instagram handle is LKM craft I also have a website it's LexiChristinaMoore.com and Lexi is spelled with an IE and Christina is spelled with a K I really should probably change my domain name it's confusing <laughs> um, <laughs> and I think I have like a Facebook page but I'll be honest and say that I don't tend to that as much um but I do every once in a while so yeah awesome thanks for taking the time to chat with me thanks for chatting with me this was great we can do it again sometime yeah (laughs) yeah we can have one where we just dance there you go see yeah I'm I'm determined to get more people dancing on Instagram if I can I'll I'll do one and dedicate (laughs) it to you thanks All right, so again, that was Lexi Moore, and I will include the links on how you can follow along with her in the description of the episode, so you can find that on your podcast app or down in the description down below if you're watching this on YouTube. If you enjoyed this episode and all the previous episodes, please make sure to remember to hit that subscribe, like, and comment buttons. Uh, head on over to iTunes, leave a five-star review. All of that helps the algorithms know that not only do you enjoy the podcast, but others like you may enjoy it as well. And then also head on over to Patreon, check out the gang over there, the, uh, the team as you will. There's different tier levels, all kinds of merchandise options, uh, like coffee mugs and t-shirts and stickers. And uh, when you become a patron, you get access to additional content, such as hopping on one of my interviews via Zoom. If you're a patron, you'll get the link in advance and you can hop on, listen while it's happening and uh, get a chance to even ask questions of the maker at the end. All right, when I am not making podcasts, you can find me designing and making furniture and home decor at freemanfurnishings.com. You can find me across almost all the social media at Freeman Furnishings, so YouTube and uh, Instagram and TikTok and LinkedIn. 
Pinterest, Facebook, I think that's all of them. Uh, I'm most active like on a daily basis on Instagram and TikTok. That's where you can see me up to my most recent shenanigans, including Tuesday is dance day. So uh, you might want to check out those, you know, sweet hot mom moves, not. Anyways, uh, yeah, that's where you can find me hanging out when I'm not hanging out at Maker Mom Podcast on Instagram. All right, it's Wednesday. We're halfway through the week. I hope you all are have a, having a fantastic week and I will see you all on Friday. Thank you.